I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Just wanted to let you know that this episode is actually part one of a two-part series. But the good news is part two is also available right now. We know it's important to be able to binge, so we set you up. Just listen to this one first, okay? Enjoy the show. All right, so let me take this opportunity to explain myself in this odd little departure from a traditional true crime podcast that I'm putting out into the world. My hope is that the show can provide some vegetables with the murder porn we all crave. And by that, I mean I'm here to learn from the tragedies of the past with the hope of preventing them in the future. When it comes to mass murders and serial killers, people have a tendency to look back into a killer's childhood to find the reason they committed their crimes. It makes people feel safer and in control. And they pin it on things like divorce, abuse, or whatever story they can get their hands on. While a criminal's childhood is important, it is only part of the story. In fact, I would argue that some people were born to kill, but we can change that destiny. Think about it. If bad childhoods were the cause of all crime, wouldn't every abused kid become a murderer? Wouldn't the trauma from a childhood in a war-torn country create a whole generation of criminals with no exception? It just isn't that simple. So I'm here to unpack various criminals and the horrible crimes they've committed from a relatable lens of a mother. What exactly did go wrong? Or what didn't go right? Can we learn from the tragedies and prevent them in the future? How exactly do you stop yourself from raising a serial killer? Here to unpack all of that with me today is one of my very best friends, Courtney. Courtney's a mom of two and an avid true crime fan. So she's the perfect person to join me today. All right, Court, this is a safe space. Have you ever wondered if one of your children might become a serial killer? And you know which one I'm asking about? Um, I've thought about it, of course, but no. Even those tantrums? She used to throw. Okay, maybe when she was two. (laughs) (laughs) You would record them? Yes. To show her? Yes, because she would not show her true self in front of people, only for me. Yeah, I mean, she literally got stung by a bee, crushed her hand in a door once. It was like, never said anything until we were by ourselves. That's a little Yeah. Okay, what do you think? No, I love her and know her. There's nothing. She's an empath. But I don't think she was born that way. I honestly think that it's like the story of bringing the guest attendant um, food for Thanksgiving. Remember that story? And every year we would bring him, this guy, um, food for Thanksgiving. And Daniel would cry and he would clap and he would get so excited. And Daniel would want to, you know, watch the whole interaction. And Maddie, I don't know, she was like when we started at maybe three or four and she'd kick her feet in the seat and she'd be like he doesn't need that food he's got candy in there no yeah so So she grew into her empathy yes she She, did okay she grew into it i I feel like we had to kind of teach her a little bit okay well this is the great podcast because my argument is that you can't teach empathy right so we're gonna have to see if you uncovered it i mean if you guys met her she's like the most wonderful darling yes but i feel like i did that you did okay you created the (laughs) non-serial killer i I did (laughs) she's like i did that was my parenting that did that okay so do you know what we're talking about here today no no idea. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. So Courtney has covered, or, or well, you could have covered it, but you followed every true crime story. I mean, I think like beyond my episodes, you literally, I can call you and be like, was this guy also raping? You're like, yeah, and ate three of his victims too. Like, right. You remember you taught me that On about August Bundy. 9th at yeah, two o one a.m. Yeah. Yes. So this, I'm, if you don't know about this, you're going to learn more than you want to know. But okay. I'm going to tell you about this crime. 
We are talking about James Holmes and the Aurora Movie Theater Massacre. Okay. Does it ring a bell? It rings a bell, but I have not dug too deep. Orange hair. Yes. Think about it. Crazy eyes. Yes. Yeah? You're there? I'm here. Okay. I got you. You got you? <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to start with his crime, which actually was a one-time event, and it was a massacre. Here we go. On July 20th, 2012, 24-year-old James Egan Holmes buys a ticket for The Dark Knight Rises, and he enters the theater around midnight. It's a midnight showing, and that's important. He chose a front row seat, and he pretended to take a phone call and left through an emergency exit. But before he left, he propped it open with a plastic doorstop. 18 minutes into the movie, he returns, but this time he is wearing combat gear, he's got a gas mask, and his getup led some of the moviegoers to think it was part of a stunt because this was like that highly anticipated Batman sequel. So they thought it was part of like, oh. It was the first opening. Exactly. But they were sadly mistaken. Instead, he proceeded to toss a tear gas grenade into the audience. And then as panicked moviegoers like scrambled for their lives running around, he fired a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun into the seats and then opened fire with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle with a high-capacity clip. It jammed, fortunately, but he still got some shots off. And then he also fired several shots with a Glock 40 caliber pistol. He was not joking. The first of 41 calls to 911 came in right after midnight, 1230. And they were reporting explosions and 10 to 20 shots fired with people down. The police station was super close. So the first officers arrived about one minute later, which is incredible. But upon their arrival, police were greeted with a horrific scene. Blood, body tissue, and popcorn all over the theater. The air was filled with tear gas and gun smoke and panic people were screaming all around them. But this is the worst. And I know that you'll this will resonate with you. Cell phones were ringing throughout the theater, but eerily nobody was answering them. And that's what they remember. When all was said and done, 10 people lay dead in the theater and two more were pronounced dead at the hospitals. The victims included two active servicemen, a single mom, a man celebrating his 27th birthday, an aspiring broadcaster who had survived a mall shooting in Toronto just to die in this shooting. That's like surviving a plane crash and then dying in a plane crash. Right. And then a six-year-old little girl and her pregnant mother lost her baby and became paralyzed. That's not good. When Holmes was apprehended behind the movie theater, he put up no resistance. Not long after, law enforcement agents had to evacuate all the buildings near his house, near his apartment in Aurora, because he told them he had booby-trapped his home with explosive devices, and he had. When James Holmes made his first court appearance on July 23rd, he was devoid of emotion. And those are all the photos we saw of him. Do you remember those? Mm -hmm. Like, he had the crazy hair, Mm -hmm. and he's just sitting there with that blank look on his face. He was eventually charged with 166 counts of murder, attempted murder, and weapons charges. In May of 2013, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. And in his 2015 trial, Holmes was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Okay. To put this tragedy in context, the Aurora Theater Massacre occurred the same year as five other horrific mass shootings, including Sandy Hook. Mm and the Sikh Temple shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Do you remember talking to me the morning of Sandy Hook? Yes, I'll never forget that day. I had to go on CNN all day. I think I was with Dr. Drew, and you called me early in the morning because you had a six-year-old. Right, I was going to pick her up at 12 o'clock. Yeah. And I, I will never forget that day. You said something really poignant to me, and I'll never forget it. You said, Michelle, they sent their six year olds off to school that morning with their little backpacks, and they don't come home, and the sheets in their room still smell like them yeah. in their little unmade beds. And their PJs. And their PJs Stop still it. smell like them. Yes. Oh, we've got a crier. Uh, um, I couldn't keep it together on air that day, yeah. and neither could any of the other hosts. Mass shootings are horrible, especially when children are involved. And I think that's why this is poignant, is we need to at least learn what we can from them so right. that we can do, if there's something we can do, which I think there is, We have to learn about it, you know? Right. All right. So I do think, though, really quick, 
that they've come so far in terms of, you know, being proactive, you know, instead of reactive. Like they, with, you know, Columbine, it took them like six hours to break into that school, mm -hmm. right? Then there was other shootings and then Sandy Hook took them a long time to enter that school. And I remember those babies were in there all night. They're, they they made them stay in there all night. The, the, one, the surviving children? No. The, the bodies? All the bodies. So the parents couldn't even see their kids. Oh, God. Then fast forward to say, you know, the Colorado, this this shooting, they were there in one minute, one minute. and then now they're going in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And now, like, the teachers are have the locks on the doors, and now they're they're learning so much because they're so frequent and it's happening so much. And, oh, and um, it's horrifying because now they're trained. Right. Which is great because now they can respond quicker. But before Columbine, this never happened. Right. And we get the prize of being the only country in which it does happen. Right. And what does that say? We, we'll get into that. Okay. We'll get into that. Combined, the shootings that I just mentioned, the six shootings, left 71 dead and 80 injured. 12 of those casualties and 70 of the injured were a result of James Holmes Theater Massacre. More people were killed and injured in that shooting than in the country's history up to that point in any one shooting. And the shooting, of course, sparked a ton of controversy over gun control and most unfortunately, further stigmatized people with mental illness. And that's going to be important. So how could this have happened and could it have been prevented? Let's take a look back at the childhood of James Holmes and see what we can piece together. James Egan Holmes was born in San Diego, California. His father was a mathematician and his mom was a registered nurse and he had one sibling, a sister. Now, I'm going to say something about his family right now that I think comes up later, but they were kind of introverted. They weren't a particular gregarious family. They were a shire family, a little more insular. At a young age, Holmes had a love for sports and attended church religiously with his family like any other normal eight-year-old, seven-year-old. But by the time he was eight, James started having some issues. Right around that age, James took him to a counselor because he started throwing things and hitting people and acting out. And I want to stop to say it's really easy to blame parents when you end up with a murderer. And we're seeing that happen more and more. But, like, she did the right thing. It's really hard to admit something's wrong with your kid. It's really hard because it's a reflection. You think falsely that it's a reflection on your parenting. Of your parenting, of course. We all think that, right? You, Your child, like, throws a fit in the restaurant and everybody's looking at you saying, what's wrong with those parents? Why can't they right. control their child? Right. So sometimes they hide this. They don't want to talk to a pediatrician, right. a teacher, a counselor about it because they're ashamed. Right. Well, I'm hoping to, like, we can't do that. We can't. Kids are born with temperaments and dispositions and potentially problems that, they're just, they just come with. Right. So we have to be able to recognize them to hopefully nudge them away from a bad trajectory. Or you think like he's throwing a fit, he's tired, he's, you make excuses, mm -hmm. which I'm not saying they're excuses, but we all do that, right? With our kids. Like, you don't want oh, something to be wrong. No. Or you think, or you push it out of your head like, oh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why they're behaving this way. Right. Right. Or it's normal. It's normal. Well, and that's the other kicker is that normative behavior includes this type of acting out at age eight. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, it's not unusual for an eight-year-old, but he was obviously doing it to a level that made her alarmed. And so right. she did try. She took him to a counselor. By age 11, the symptoms were alarming and much worse. At this age, he starts exhibiting signs of chronic depression, and then he even attempted suicide. At 11? So, 11. 11. Okay, that's so at that pretty point, alarming. That's alarming. 11's young. Although we're seeing it more now right. with the bullying, but 11's really young to try to kill yourself. But here's the kicker. Starting around this time, Holmes describes seeing scary nail ghosts on the walls of his room at night. Alongside shadows and flickers in the corners of his eyes that he would later say that th they would all fight each other. The shadows were fighting each other with firearms and weapons. Now, that's a red flag. Right. I mean, kids have wild and vivid imaginations, but... Especially if they see a movie or, you know, a mm -hmm. TV show or, you know... Right. But I think it's important... So you can have, like, your child who has an imaginary friend, and that's one thing. But if they're reporting seeing and hearing things that we know aren't there... Right. I'm not saying you have to go put them in a padded cell, but I think you should pay attention and, you know, log it. Right. I've never met or evaluated James Holmes... But I truly believe that if during his childhood 
he had an evaluation from a child psychiatrist and had shared that he sees and hears things that aren't there, he would have at least been followed or examined for what we call prodromal symptoms of schizophrenia and or some other psychotic disorder could have been suspected. Mm -hmm. And if he had, theoretically, as he reached adulthood, he could have been treated and mentally healthier. And but he you'd also have to get the the proper diagnosis, right? Like if, say you go to a, a psychologist and you're like, something's wrong with my kid. And can you? And they're like, oh, no, they're fine. They're, it's, I mean, do you Bingo. know what I mean? Like you'd have to find the right, the perfect time, mm -hmm. the perfect psychologist. The per Like that's crazy. I think that's what happened here. I yeah. think he was seen for his depression and a suicide attempt which leads to diagnoses like depression or borderline personality disorder because of the suicide attempt. Right. And what gets ignored are the psychotic features. The psychotic features were likely causing the depression. Right. But in instead, because we don't know, these kids don't come with a handout. We're taught to put them on their back so they don't suffocate, to not let them near bodies of water and to use a five-point harness. Right. And you better breastfeed or the breastfeeding police are going to get you. Right. But no one says, look for prodromal signs of psychotic disorders and had somebody here's the thing about james holmes he's super curious about his own broken brain and he says so so i suspect if he had been identified as somebody with these early symptoms of a psychotic disorder he would have been medically compliant he right. would have taken his meds he was young enough he was young enough and he wanted help he sought right. help out we'll, we'll see as we go on schizophrenia in children is it even a thing well in short Technically, yes, it is a thing. Schizophrenia can be detected in children. And I definitely want to address that because as parents, we can't know what to look for unless we know what to look for. So right. all that being said, the appearance of symptoms of psychosis before age 12 is extremely rare. It's actually less than 1 60th as common as the adult onset type. So again, it's super rare. So you don't expect it, but when it happens... Um, it's important to pay attention to because for those who do go on to develop full-blown schizophrenia or adult onset, it's not uncommon for them to have had started experiencing the symptoms early in childhood. So puberty, adolescence, and that's why we need to be aware of the symptoms and looking out for them. So James was clearly having these types of symptoms as a child, but nothing was done about it. And he was kind of quiet about it. He did tell some people, but he wasn't he wasn't telling everybody. As the parents are focusing on the suicide attempt and the depression, what they didn't know was that the psychiatric symptoms that were popping up were much more important. So the period of adolescence in which somebody can experience these early warning signs is called prodrome. And it's just, they're not full-blown symptoms. They're just like symptom light. But that's what they look like when they're first coming out, and mm -hmm. the prodromal symptoms. But for kids who are having these symptoms, like hearing and seeing things that aren't there, they might not admit to it unless they're asked because they don't know that we're not all seeing oh, right, those things. Right. So they don't know that this is super weird. They could think other kids feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if they're shy and they're, you know, introvert and they don't really talk to their friends, but how would they know? How would they know that we don't all wake up and, you know, see these things on the wall that right. aren't there? So when it comes to knowing what to look for, kids with this childhood onset of these schizophrenic spectrum disorders will usually show delays in language and other functions long before psychiatric symptoms, such as hallucinations and delusions and disordered thinking. And as a matter of fact, in the first years of life, about 30% of these children have transient symptoms of pervasive developmental disorder, such as rocking, posturing, and arm flapping. But... I know a few of those kids. Exactly. <laughs> That's, I rocked. Right. You did? Uh, yes, and I hit my head on the crib. Yeah, my parents did actually worry about it. This explains a few. It does. Things. It explains a lot. Well, and that was my response, too, when I was diving into all of these prodromal symptoms. It's like, well, how do you disentangle that from other childhood problems? Right. Well, there's a whole host of other problems, too. So let's look at them. The child feels like their brain is broken or not working, and I think that is a trigger. That's a triggering element if somebody were to say that to me feeling like their mind or their eyes are playing tricks on them seeing things and hearing voices that are not real hearing knocking tapping clicking or their names being called confused thoughts wild and bizarre thoughts and ideas um, peculiar behavior but kids are weird mm -hmm. increased sensitivity to light and sound smell and touch so they're they're 
all of their senses are heightened. The concept that people are out to get them, which is the paranoia is kind of slipping in. Fearfulness and suspicion that isn't warranted, like beyond stranger danger, um, withdrawal from others, and a difficult time making and keeping friends. But we all know kids who right. had that problem. Difficulty with speaking, writing, focusing, or managing simple tasks. Hello, ADD. <clears throat> so what comes up for you, Courtney, when I'm reading those symptoms? I mean, for me, it's like, Every autism spectrum kid we know did this. Right. There's so much testing now. And there's so much, you know, there's dyslexia and there's sensory issues. And there's so many. I mean, it would be so hard to right? because you, nobody wants to think that their kid is, is schizophrenic. Right. Or going to, right. you know, kill people later on, especially yeah. if you come from a good family. Maybe, you know. Yeah, you're not looking for that. If you had Uncle Frank that was like off. We'll wait and see. We do. All right. We do have Uncle Frank. Okay. Here's the thing. When I read this, I'm like, okay. I mean, I don't want to call people out right. from our school. But there were a lot of different kids. Interesting. Who, and they couldn't keep yeah. friends. And they couldn't. For me, it's the, the, the fact that their brain feels different and that they're seeing things and hearing things. So, yes, like, of course, a lot of this describes just awkward behavior that could you know, be a developmental problem. It could be a autism spectrum disorder, but some of these are different. And I think that's what I want to highlight. It's the hearing their names, clicking, tapping. I mean, that's what he, James Holmes heard. Those things aren't necessarily, the rocking and the arm flapping could be, you know, a sign Excitement of- Excitement or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and not making friends. And that could be Asperger's. That can be a host, whole host of things. But these weird sensory differences, I think is what I really want to shine a light on here. Right. And what's so important is that pediatricians, parents, teachers, we all need a better understanding of these types of behaviors. I promise you, up until recently, if you brought that child to a pediatrician, they're not thinking prodromal schizophrenia. They're thinking, uh, probably on the spectrum for autism. Right. This is not where they go. But these specific symptoms, I think, is what we really need to focus on. It does not mean there's no hope for your child. It just means if you can get it treated now, everything that is treated in childhood has a better outcome right. than if we wait. Doesn't mean that it won't happen. Right. But it it's just you have a better chance of it not happening right. if you or, get help early. Right. Or like, yeah. let's knock them off of this. You don't want the brain to go further and deeper into the disorder or the disease before you get it treated. Right. And then once they get older, you have no control over oh, what God. they do anyway. If they're going to stay on their meds or if they're, you know what I mean, S still seek help. That's right. The compliance can come from home at this point. Right. Okay, so let's talk about his early adulthood because things start actually going pretty well for James, which sounds like a great thing, but I think it's probably one of the reasons he went undetected. As he started growing from a child to a young man, in many ways he was doing really well and looked great on paper. James Holmes began attending UC Riverside, University of California, Riverside, and he secured a really cool intern position as a computer program at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Lots of my colleagues in graduate school wanted that position, and actually one of them got it. And it's a really, it's a prestigious place. It's, it's where incredible research is done. So he can't not be smart. I mean, he's smart right. and he's talented. And in 2008, Holmes even took a job as a counselor at a summer camp for kids aged 7 through 14 which is weird because he ended up killing a child later. And everything seemed basically normal to this point. In 2010, Holmes graduated with a degree in neuroscience with the highest honors. He had a 4.0. He was killing it. And he was described as being a very effective group leader. He took his education really seriously. So you could think how his parents are like, wow, that was a weird phase he went through. Thank goodness he's okay now. But let's examine that. You kind of stop paying attention once the kid... It's a protective factor. Being high... Being smart and having a high IQ is a protective factor against almost everything. Mm -hmm. Abuse, trauma, mental illness, even ADD. Like the squeaky kids get the oil. And if you're functioning, mm -hmm. your pediatrician and your doctor isn't there. I mean, a pediatrician and your teachers aren't necessarily paying that much attention right. to you. Right. They're not going to know what to look for. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. One of the big takeaways of the show is that it is incredibly important to prioritize your brain health, and that means showing up for yourself through all of the struggles that life can bring. BetterHelp Online Therapy is here for the twists and turns that might come up for you. They will assess your needs, and they can match you with your own licensed professional 
therapist in less than 48 hours. And let me tell you, that is quick. You can often wait weeks to get an appointment with traditional therapy. And look, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I love therapy. And I don't understand the stigma around it because even if you're not going through something, it is super important to make sure your side of the street is sweeped. It is essential and a necessary part of my life and I simply cannot live without it. Seriously, getting yourself the professional help you need, and we all need it, is not only good for you, but it's a great example for the people around you in your life. And who doesn't want to have the people around them in therapy? BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's a professional therapy done securely online, and the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send an actual message to your therapist. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't ever have to sit in that uncomfortable waiting room like you did with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is still available. BetterHelp is a great way to show up for yourself and invest in your well-being because, well, you deserve some inner peace. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash how not. That's better, H-E-L-P, and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. As a special offer for How Not to Raise a Serial Killer listeners, BetterHelp is offering 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash how not. That's betterhelp.com forward slash how not. So as he ages and gets into his early 20s, unfortunately, his mental illness revved up, which is expected because we usually see full-blown psychotic breaks between like, I don't know, late teens and early 20s, 16 to 24, somewhere in there. And according to his defense attorney, Catherine Spangler, James decided to study neuroscience in the first place so that he could figure out what was wrong with his brain. Right. So he was aware that something was different at this point. But after his graduation, he began to act in an eccentric and dissociative manner. So these weird symptoms are back again. And here's another very important moment. While you don't expect people to be guessing schizophrenia in a young child, you do expect it to pop up on people's radars when he's a young adult. This is when it happens. And get this, you talk about Uncle Frank. Three of James's relatives had very severe mental illness, mm-hmm. schizophrenia. Two grandfathers suffered from schizophrenia, and his aunt was even hospitalized for it. Red flags, right. everyone. If you have a relative with a severe psychotic disorder, you need to recognize that, well, first of all, you can see it's in the pedigree to begin with, but it has a giant genetic underpinning. And these numbers aren't going to sound huge, but they're important. If you have a first-degree relative, that's a parent, a child, or a sibling, you have <clears throat> your chances of becoming schizophrenic raised by 10%. If you have two parents with schizophrenia, it raises to 40%. Right. So we know that there's an incredible genetic underpinning for this. We know that. Now, these relatives I'm describing for you are not first-degree relatives, but it certainly indicates that there's probably a constellation of genes right. floating around in this Somewhere pedigree down the line. Yeah. that are popping up. We'll put a pin in that. So was he, did his parents know when he was in his 20s that he was still having issues? It's unclear. They- his dad at one point says he was acting a little strange, but here's the thing, and I have so much sympathy for his parents. They're introverted and shy and different themselves. So they thought he was just like them. Like when he was having a hard time making friends and he was a little different, they kept saying, well, we're a little like right. that. that. That was how our childhood was. Right. Or how, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, they stopped short of saying, we're, we're different. We're weird. Right. You know? So I really I had a lot of, of empathy for them in this situation. In 2010, Holmes moves back to San Diego and works in a pill and capsule coating factory. And their co-workers did notice he was being unsocial and acting strange. But again, now he's adult. So it's like nobody's thinking about it when he's a child. But when he's adult, everyone's hands off. No one's going to be like, you're weird. Are you okay? Right. So it's this kind of... They're just going to talk about him behind his back. That's right. Or on a podcast. Right. (laughs) So, okay. So then we have this, and here's kind of the crux of what we need to, to know to prevent these things. Like, it's all these people's responsibility when he's a kid. 
but no one knows to look for it. Now people know it's a possibility, but no one wants to get their hands dirty. Right. A year later, James Holmes begins pursuing his PhD at the University of Colorado, like me. Um, but his was the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora. And it's in neuroscience, like mine. But it's so interesting. Like, he's doing this because he wants to know what's wrong with right. him. Right. He wants answers. He wants answers and help, I think. And he even got a $21,000 grant to study. And that's not uncommon to get the like, grants to study these scientific kind of issues and problems. But he had to have written a grant application, which takes incredible focus. Right. So fellow grad students noted that their initial impressions of James, that he was wildly smart with like a really wry sense of humor um, that snuck out every now and then. And like they even talked about how he was ta- he was saying, take it to the bank when he was talking about this enzyme called ATM. So, I mean, this is a bunch of nerds, by the right. way, we're talking about now. No offense, but I'm in the group. And it's it's a bunch of, you know, they're students, they're studiers. Yeah. I don't know if we're smart, but we're nerdy. And, um, you know, so everyone's a little dorky at this point. So you have to, I'm sorry, I'm offending PhDs over the, over the world, but we know we're dorks. So I'm proud of it. Well, um, <laughs> or you should be. But you can see how it's not, if they're saying he's different, then there's something to note. But everyone's also a little different at this point. So it gets worse, though. Many other students described a pairing of laconic ease with almost crippling social discomfort and a tendency to communicate in one word sentences. This is a psychotic disorder popping up. Like this is, it's emerging in full form now and no one's paying attention to it. Right. He had trouble making eye contact, but he could make surprising forays into extroversion, mugging the camera when he needed to if something was being filmed. But in the springtime, he stopped making jokes during his presentations and his demeanor shifted notably. He also had apparently broken up with a girlfriend, which devastated him. And these are triggering events. This is like, that's one triggering event. There's another one coming up. For somebody with social problems and having psychotic breaking episodes, like a psychotic break, you get triggered. You can have triggers that can really push something forward. Mm -hmm. And I think breaking up with his girlfriend was something like that for him. Okay. Right, because he just wanted to give up, basically, and just screw it. Screw it. Why not? Well, and I imagine getting a girlfriend wasn't easy. Right. I mean, when you're having a hard time completing sentences, right? So here's this other point. We talk about these pivotal moments of like how not to raise a serial killer. Here's another moment. That his parents, his teachers, his pediatricians might not have been armed with what to look for for a child who's about to develop a psychotic disorder. Even though he showed the symptoms, they just don't know. Again, right. no handout. Hopefully, people listening to this podcast will then know. I'm like, oh my God, these neighbors' kids are right. <laughs> about to have psychotic breaks. But it's important to get this out there. But here's where the next group of people went wrong. One of the biggest oversights was the sharp decline in his academic performance. So in the spring... Months before the shooting, he had turned in a midterm essay that uh, one of his professors said was absolutely spectacular in that it was written at the level of a professional in the field. It was beautifully written, more than I could have expected from a first-year student. But by early June, he had done poorly on his oral exams. And rather than note the stark shift in his academics performance, his professors told him to find a different career. Mm. I want to mention something about this. Oral exams are the last weeding out process when you're getting your PhD. It's before you present your dissertation and then you do your dissertation and defend it. So this is a place where it's really difficult for everybody. Mm-hmm. I did poorly on mine. I almost dropped out. Remember? Kelly's right. like, drop Ke- out! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom's like, oh, don't you dare. I've told everyone you're Dr. Ward. You right. can't drop out. So this is like the most stressful, triggering event for a mentally healthy person. Mm-hmm. Imagine you're James Holmes. Right. You're really messed up. You know you're messed up, and you're bombing your quals, right. your oral exams. This is the second event, big event of in yes. his life as of recent. Yes. Like, before this so shooting. he is now steeped into his 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 psychotic disorder, his mental illness, and he has two triggering events. His girlfriend dumps him, and he does poorly on his qualifying exams. Right. Soon after that, he dropped out and left campus. I should mention also... People show up to their defenses with guns and kill their committees. That has happened. That's how stressful this is. Um, A professor who literally was next door to me in graduate school named Bosco recently was stabbed to death at USC by his graduate student. Like, it's a really stressful kind of a powder keg. And if you're not mentally healthy, 
it can be super triggering. So, you know, when it comes to minors, teachers often feel the responsibility to take notice and shifts in behavior and performance of the children. And they need to know that because they need to make sure that there's not something wrong at home. They recognize that responsibility. Of course, they're not armed with necessarily picking up severe mental disorders, but they know the basics with kids. But here's an argument. James Holmes is an adult and he's a and, and he's not a minor. But when you think of tuition costs and 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 what goes into these graduate degrees, I think students and parents are essentially paying. You sh- they're paying these institutions and these academicians to pay attention to them. Right. Not just educate them, but pay attention to them. So or adults or not, these professors should have taken notes of these huge changes in him and brought it to somebody's attention. Right. It's not enough to say, oh my God, he got weird. Bye-bye. It's right. not right. It's not fair because even though these are not children who you need to take full authority of, you are dealing with the population that is highest at risk for having psychotic breaks. And if you're going to work with that population, I truly believe you need to be informed and you need to be the first line of defense, just like the parents, teachers, and pediatricians were when James was little. Now these professors, these, these colleagues, all of these people who surround him now are the first line of defense and nobody said a word. Right. Like, there's so much pressure today, like with, you know, thinking about every movie, every song, you always relate it to yourself, Mm -hmm. right? So as you were talking, I was thinking about my son that's 17. He's, you know, he, you know, Daniel, he's smart. He's not motivated. What? Um, Really last minute, whatever. But he got COVID and he's a junior and it wrecked him, right? So when he went back to school, they were like, sorry, you got to catch up. This is school. Like... Sorry that, you know, you got to take this test even though you were out for eight days. So he doesn't have the instruction. So but he, he doesn't have the instruction, has to take it. And so his grades were bombing. And then he's thinking, this is my junior year. I need these grades to get into college, right? And now there's so much pressure with, did you start a foundation? Yeah. Are you a rower? Have you Are you a dancer? You, yeah, exactly. There's so much. It's so different now. And he's like, I'm going to be screwed by these two teachers <sighs> the whole trajectory of my life is changing because of these two teachers. They that, shouldn't be able to wield that much power. Right? But that, like, that's like what we're talking about with, with him is he's like, he he didn't do well. He, you know, he probably asked for help. They were like, nope, we got to move on. You bombed it, whatever. Yeah. It's the same thing. I'm not that I think my son is crazy, but I'm just saying that I think that then he started, I, I noticed a couple weeks after, he started studying less. And he kind of oh. just gave in to, well, I'm kind of screwed. So maybe I'll just go to a different school. Yeah, than that's what I when he started planning. talking about junior college. And he'd never talked about junior college right. again before that. Yeah. But it's crazy. Like, we sometimes, I think, underestimate the amount of pressure and stress children are under. Yes. And they're just told, deal with it. Deal with it. And it, social media. It plays oh, I can't such a, I mean, that's another podcast. But it does... It does ring true that our world is so different, and it's not going anywhere. It's not going backwards. Exactly. It's only going to get worse. So they're seeing their friends get into Harvard and Stanford and all the videos and the families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so much pressure and where you're going and where you're vacationing. And and it's a lot. For a mentally healthy person, it's a lot. Exactly. And then you sprinkle in. I mean, psychiatric disorders are not uncommon. Your brain is an organ. And just like your kidneys can be, you know, imbalanced and need dialysis and not functioning properly and have too much creatinine, your brain can be imbalanced too and very sick. And it's, it's this phenomenon, like unless you have a stroke or a brain tumor, nobody expects something really to be wrong with your brain. Right. And this is an example of that at these very delicate times. It's no wonder that those are the ages when the psychotic breaks really emerge is right. because of, think about that pressure. Yeah, it makes sense. Oh, give Daniel a hug for me, I please. Will. Okay. So was James getting psychiatric treatment? It's a good question. He was. He actually was to the best he could. A report by NBC News confirmed that James had met with at least three mental health professionals while he was at the University of Colorado before carrying out the shooting. So he was trying to get help. That is not excuse his behavior. But it's important to know, We, if the point of this podcast is for you, the listener, to know what to look for, we have to identify all these places where he slipped through the cracks. So he So did. he cared. He cared. Well, I don't know if he cared about other people. Right. But he cared about himself. He cared about himself. Yeah. And he wanted to know what was wrong. 
But his treatment was really weird, and we'll get into that. At one point, his psychiatrist, Dr. Lynn Fenton, grew concerned enough that she alerted at least one member of the university's threat assessment team that Holmes might be dangerous. She did the right freaking thing. Mm -hmm. Can we say fuck on this podcast? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. She did the right fucking thing. And (laughs) we'll decide which way it sounds better. Flippin'. She did the right, <laughs> gosh darn it. Oh, fetch. <laughs> Remember the Mormons at our, in our school would always say, fetch. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm on to you and your bishop. Dr. Fenton asked the campus police to find out if he had a criminal record, and he did not. The official said that nothing Holmes had done thus far rose to the threshold set by Colorado to hospitalize somebody involuntarily. In her notes, Dr. Fenton repeatedly expressed concern over James's homicidal thoughts. So he's telling her he's feeling like killing people, but he refused to discuss specifics with her, saying it would lock him up if he dared to share the details with her. So he knows this. Right. He knows he can't tell her the furtherance. He can't tell her his plan. Right. Because then she can. Right. Or she has to. Has to. Report it. Has to. Right. That's the key. So what is she to do? Yeah. He also he also was angry um, that she wouldn't tell him her own philosophical ideas of the purpose of life and accused her of being a pill pusher. Ultimately, Fenton consulted a second psychiatrist, notified the university's threat assessment team, and contacted Holmes's mother against his wishes. Mm. Which is interesting. I wasn't I didn't know that you could do that because he's twenty, right? Right. Right. He's not a minor, but she concluded that he did not meet the criteria for a mental health hold, unfortunately. To be clear, a mental health hold in the state of Colorado requires that a person has a mental illness and as a result of such mental illness is a danger to others. But they specifically state that a danger to others needs to be manifested by evidence of recent homicidal or other violent behavior by the person in question. So mm. that, And that others are reasonably are in reasonable fear of violent behavior and serious physical harm to them as evidenced by a recent act, attempt, or threat to do physical harm by the person in question. So in other words, blood pretty much has to be shed if you're going to justify hospitalizing somebody against their will. Right. So we, I mean, that ain't right. No. I feel like the standard needs to be lower. I understand the ACLU is not going to dig this, and you listeners cannot tell on me, but... I feel like you can't have it both ways. It can't be impossible. You can't have your hands tied to help somebody with a psychiatric illness, but then on the other hand, be like, why didn't y'all prevent this? Right. It's the same thing, proactive versus reactive. Yeah. You know? And this this psychiatrist, I, I think she didn't quite diagnose him properly, but she certainly tried to get other people involved. Right. So let's talk about what his parents knew. While it's true that Dr. Fenton did contact James's parents, she did not share with them that he was having homicidal thoughts. Mm. So she told me he wasn't doing well, but didn't tell them that. And right. I have a lot of maybe shame so. or yeah, I don't or that he's not you know he's unstable. Right. James and his parents were not super communicative at this point by phone. It was mainly emails, and they were less communicative right before the psychiatrist did call in June. And she was telling him, I guess she called him just to tell him that he was dropping out of his prestigious neuroscience program. They didn't even know he was seeing a psychiatrist, and they were surprised to hear from her. His dad and his mom thought that their son was depressed or suffering from Asperger's syndrome. Mm. But James' father, Robert, says that the doctor would not return their calls asking for more information. So the psychiatrist, according to his parents, didn't return their calls. Right. When asked in her testimony what she would have done if Dr. Fenton had disclosed to her that James was having homicidal thoughts, Arlene Holmes tearfully says... I would have been crawling on all fours to get to him. Oh. He's never said he wanted to kill people. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't tell me. She didn't tell me. It's heartbreaking. Because oh. as moms, what wouldn't yeah. we do? Right? Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. And I'm sure she's bound by some, you know, hip action that she can't. But she's calling them anyway. And this is right. the biggest part. This is the most concerning part. In retrospect, James's father also noted that during winter break, James had been looking haggard and was making odd facial expressions. So now he's in full psychotic break, right? Yeah. Again, they don't know what to look for. Right. Now, I mean, we have to know. We have to know that when we see this in people, 
we see it sometimes in our unhoused populations. We see it sometimes in severely drug adult people, people who are suffering from, you know, psychotic episodes due to drugs. We do see it sometimes. When you see this in anybody, I argue that you have to say something. Right. You have to tell somebody. But the parents, it has to be hard because they're not even really communicating other than email. So say they do say something, you know, they talk to each other at the dinner table and they're like, something is off. He is being weird. He's not communicating. He's dropping out of school. His grades are getting bad. Broke up with his girlfriend. All these things. Yet if they do something or say something, then what's their relationship going to look like with him after? Right. Maybe he withdraws. But wait, there's more people who fucked up. Don't put that in. <laughs> but wait, if you order in the next two minutes, I'll tell you more right. people will really drop the ball. But it's true, though, with the parents. Like, if if your child, if you see something wrong with them mm -hmm. and then and, and they start telling you, right, then you start getting them the help or telling other people, then what's going to happen? Right. That's, that's a tricky... It's tricky, but my hope would be in this particular situation, since James was seeking out the information, if they could get him with a different psychiatrist, like you said right. earlier, it might have required some another set of eyes on this. The goodwill hunting, you got to find you the right. You got to find Robin Williams. Robin Wilden, yeah. And in this particular case, I don't know of anywhere that Dr. Fenton discusses the psychiatric symptoms. Perhaps James didn't share them with her, but I think if everyone else is saying they're seeing him, right. they're seeing how weird he is and how different he's becoming in these one, one word sentences and she should have at least, that should have been on her radar. And I'm not throwing her under the bus. This poor woman really did. Did read, her best. She did her flipping best. Right. But James was not without obvious symptoms starting at age eight. Right. And it's my hope that if we all are more informed about what this looks like, if you, the listener, is more informed about what this looks like, like we can, I don't know, get people help. Right. Or at least bring it to somebody's attention and then, you know. And talk about it. Talk about it. Maybe people don't die. Now, you may think we've already discussed a bunch of red flags, but wait, there's even more obvious ones leading up to the massacre, and these are infuriating. Two weeks prior to the shooting, Holmes sent a text to a fellow grad student asking if she'd heard of dysphoric mania, which is this form of bipolar depression that combines the frenetic energy of mania with agitation and dark thoughts, and in some cases, paranoid delusions and depression. She messaged him back asking if it could be managed with treatment. And he replies, it was, but added that she should stay away from him because he's bad news. Uh, ding, 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 people. Right. Red flag. James told another student in March that he wanted to kill people when his life was over. I feel like that doesn't come up often in normal conversation. No. I, I feel like if someone told me they wanted to kill people, I might, I don't know, do something. Tell somebody. Tell someone. Right. No? More like, than one person. The mailman. Yeah, my mom. The, right. Like, <laughs> Guy at the grocery store. Well, certainly our professors. Right. I mean, but then somebody recently brought up a good point to me that, like, we're not a culture that does that, really. Like, we're kind of individualists, and we kind of, like, mind our own business. But should we? In these right. cases, these are extreme. Look at the consequences. Right. Meanwhile, packages containing thousands of rounds of fucking ammunition that he had bought online began arriving at school and his apartment. Wow. In May... He showed another student his Glock semi-automatic pistol, saying he bought it for protection. So James also had a really disturbing email exchange with his ex-girlfriend, Gargi Data. James says, what I feel like doing is evil, so can't do that. Gargi says, what is so evil that you want to do? James says, kill people, of course. Mm. Taking a life will prevent that person from having any of those experiences. Gargi writes, how would that help you, though? What would taking a life give you? And James responds, human capital. Some people may make a million dollars, others 100000 but life is priceless. You take away a life and your human capital is limitless. Gargi responds, well, what would you do with all that human capital? James says, have a more meaningful life. Mm. So he might be mentally ill, but he's coming across pretty flippin' selfish at this right. point, too. Like, his life is so much more important than other people's that he needs to create more meaning for it. Right. Where's your empathy? Right. Clearly. And yeah. also, Gargi, why is this not being shared? Right. She didn't tell anybody? Not that I know of. Right. Not that I saw. Right. 
I mean, perhaps she did. She certainly did when she was on the stand. Well, she was but... probably fearful for her own life if he's saying that, right? Wouldn't you? Is if that was your ex, right? That's not an unfair point. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane, and our producer and researcher is Courtney Blomquist. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.